good afternoon or good morning or good evening or when you're ever you're listening to this uh miss metzler here with another exciting english 9c slideshow presentation <laughs> today we'll be talking about uh the iambic meter and iambic pentameter now uh, you might recall that iambic uh, was one of your, of your vocabulary words. So we're just going to be combining some concepts together and looking at some examples today. You might, might remember that uh, the iambic meter is like a heartbeat. So da-dum, 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 da-dum. I'm going to play a little bit on a, um, a set of bongo drums I have here. Uh, normally, I'd have you guys uh, try this out for yourself in class. But if you'd like, uh, just on whatever surface you've got handy, uh, you can tap out uh, an iambic rhythm with me. might notice that one of those beats is just a little bit stronger than the other, um, similar to uh, the beat of a heart, where you've got uh, one unaccented syllable and an accented syllable um, in each set of beats. So let's talk a little bit more about this. Let's, uh, let's sort of break it down a little bit. So uh, the iambic rhythm describes a rhythm that consists of two beats or syllables. So think of, uh, if you're thinking about music, you might think of beats. If you're thinking about words or poetry, you'll be thinking about syllables. Now, uh, two beats or two syllables in which the first beat or syllable is unstressed and the second beat or syllable is stressed, like the beating of a heart. Ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. So um, we're, we're using some, some sort of weird words here. Um, an iamb is a type of metric or foot. Um, if something is in iambic meter, it's made of iambs. So um, each iamb has two syllables that go ba-boom. Let's try it again. Ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. Go ahead, tap it out, ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. Now, a poetic foot is a unit of stressed and unstressed syllables in a line of poetry. So basically, it's just um, a, a word or a set of syllables that has uh, an unstressed and stressed syllable in it um, in any number of combinations. Here's an example of what you might hear as far as the iambic rhythm goes. Now, um, some of you may want to look away for this. Others of you will find this fascinating, but listen listen to the beat. Um, you can also hear other little things going on here because the, the human heart is just an amazing thing. So if you need to look away, do that. But in any case, listen. I think you get the idea. For those of you who care about where words come from, I know there are a few of you who care about this kind of thing. Uh, I am because one of those words is kind of interesting because it's the same as it was, just about the same, I should say, as, as it was um, back in early Greek times, and it means the same thing. So sometimes uh, meanings of words sort of change over time, but it, uh, iambic is one of those words that um, has always meant about the same thing. So from the Greek, we have iambos, um, and then it goes all the way through um, later Greek into Latin, and then we have French, and then English, and then it comes back into um, calling it iambic in about the mid-16th century. 
Now we can hear di the iambic rhythm in, in songs. Now, mostly what we're gonna be talking about is the iambic meter or rhythm in poetry, but I find it really useful to think about it in songs as well, because this helps us to identify the rhythm better. So uh, if you listen to Tchaikovsky's Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairies, um, you can hear this rhythm really strongly. Um, now it's not, um, it, it changes up throughout the course of the song. Um, so, so listen for it at the beginning, listen how it changes up um, throughout the course of the song. Now this version here, um, is a, a little bit different from the ones you might have heard uh, in the past, performed here by the Jingle Bell Cows. So um, some people are offended by this video. Um, I, I know I'm not gonna apologize, but if you need to look away, feel free. So here we go. You guys get the idea there. If you're if you're worried about my sanity, don't be. All right. Uh, so we've heard uh, uh, the iambic rhythm in music. Bom, ba, bom, ba, bom, ba. Um, and we can also hear it in language. And in fact, you can hear it in everyday language. You can hear it in poetry. Um, you can hear it. In, you can hear it in lyrics to songs. You can hear it all over the place. Now, uh, the beats or syllables of the iambic rhythm can be in a single wor word or in two words. Now, before we get into this, we need to understand that for any two-syllable word, um, particularly in the, the English language, but um, probably, I'm, I'm guessing, any language, um, the, the, the syllables um, each have a different accent. Um, to them. Um, and sometimes we don't recognize that, but when we start thinking about it, we can hear those rhythms. So here are some examples of words that have an iambic rhythm just naturally. Exist. Belong. The one. Predict. Away. We played. You know. I can't. Require. Insane. Now, you could, in some of these cases, where you've got two words, you could emphasize things a little bit differently, end up with a different rhythm. But here, as I've said them, these are all, all these words have the iambic rhythm to them. Or meter. I'm using the words meter and rhythm interchangeably. So, 
um, when we are looking at um, lines of poetry, we can show which syllables are stressed and which ones are unstressed. So let's take a look at a, just a little, a little ditty here. Here we go. There lived a wife at Usher's well, and a wealthy wife was she. She had three stout and stalwart sons and sent them o'er the sea. This little poem is um, written in with the iambic meter. And we can see that the different syllables are stressed and unstressed. So it starts out with an unstressed syllable. Stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed. There lived a wife at Usher's well. So you can hear how those things are stressed or unstressed. I'm going to go shut my door because I, I see my husband coming up the driveway. All right. So um, so how do we show them? We show them with these, these little marks here. And you can also see that you can show this right here is an I am. This is an I am. This is an I am, this is an I am. And we can mark those off with these little stress or these little dividers here. I guess my computer decided to go to the next one. All right, so you can see those dividers. So let's take a look at the next page here. So um, the question, how do we show stressed and unstressed syllables? Um, so we use what we call diacritical marks. You may have heard these when you're learning, uh, if you've learned other languages. Um, so for an unstressed syllable, we use a mark called a breathe, and it looks like a little u. For a stressed syllable, we use a little mark called an ictus or a rhythmical accent. So you can use these terms interchangeably. And this is what the marks look like. And note once again the dividers between each foot or I am. So we've got the little U here. That's the breathe. We've got the ictus here. Look, it just looks like a regular accent. So you can think of that as an accent. So you can also, this is an easy way to remember this. So uh, the little U can mean unstressed unstressed. And then the accent, we know that from um, looking at other language. So, there lived a wife at Usher's well. Okay, So this is how you mark the different accents in uh, a line of poetry with diacritical marks. Diacritical. Again, the little u is called a breve. And the accent is called an ictus, or a rhythmical accent. And remember that every two syllables, starting with an unstressed and then followed by a stressed, is an I am. It's a type of foot. Once again, we find this iambic rhythm everywhere. Poetry, music, drama, everyday speech. We've looked at this example before. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam, I am. I do not like them in a boat. I do not like them with a goat. I do not like them in a house. I do not like them with a mouse. Go ahead and say that. So I'm going to give you guys, if you need to, to stop the video here and, and practice that for a moment. Now you might be saying, oh, this is just silly. Why would I do that? Well, the best way to learn things about language is by saying them, not by hearing them only. So not just by listening to me, but by practicing them yourself. So I'm going to give you just a moment to do that. All right, if you didn't get a chance to do that just now, make sure you take the time. Um, so oftentimes we think uh, that we, we know English, and we do, but by uh, practicing certain ways of saying things, we can learn it even better, and we can uh, learn these concepts even better. Now this next video I'm gonna play for you guys is actually just meant to be kind of a fun thing. Um, Back in the 80s, uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson was a very popular public figure, and he had uh, lots of people who, who listened to his um, 
listen to his sermons. So he, he, he was and is a religious man. And, um, but he, he went on Saturday night live and, um, well, see what, and he, he actually was a pretty serious guy, but see, see what he did with, um, Sam, I am. Tonight, rather than read from first and second Samuel, I read from Sam, I am. Or the latter day Saint Seuss. You do not like green eggs and ham? I do not like them. Sam, I am. I could not, would not on a boat. I will not, will not look a goat. I will not eat them in the rain. I will not eat them on a train. Not in the dark, not on a tree, not in the car. You let me be. I don't like them in a the box. I do not like them with a fox. I will not eat them with a house. I do not like them with a mouse. I do not like them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. Sam, I am. You're not like them, so you say. Try them, try them, and you may. Try them, and you may, I say. Sam, if you will let me be, I will try them, you will see. Say, I like green eggs and ham. I do, I like them, Sam, I am. And I would eat them with a book. And I would eat them with a goat. I do so like green eggs and ham. Thank you, thank you, Sam. I am. All right, that was just kind of a fun thing there. All right, so um, you guys, this is something that I wrote several years ago when I first um, really started discovering the iambic rhythm, um, and I was finding it everywhere. So here, here's my little something. The iambic rhythm is everywhere. Classical songs, rap, poetry, dance, all of these presentations of the iambic rhythm are mimics of the heartbeat. In so many of our poems, plays, and songs, we are quite literally speaking the language of the human heart. This most natural rhythm, the one that gives each of us our very lifeblood, is the one that guides us in our attempts to communicate some of our strongest emotions, love, fear, sadness, anger, all of the emotions that the heart itself expresses, whether it might race in moments of passion, skip a beat in fear, or become heavy with sadness, or the emotions of our, about which we sing, dance, and write poetry. What we have done is to put our hearts on our sleeves, or the page, or the stage, or in a trembling voice. Indeed, what we have given, what we have given a voice to, our hearts, is our hearts. And this is why the iambic meter is so very powerful. So as we marvel at the genius of Shakespeare, Tchaikovsky, and Eminem, some deference is to be given to the human heart as their common muse. And when we speak of letting our hearts be our guides, the meaning is perhaps more visceral than we intend. Something visceral is something that you can feel. So, you guys, we're only going over um, the iambic rhythm because it's um, one of the most common rhythms that we're going to find in Shakespeare. However, there are many, many others. And as you get more into poetry, you will find and hopefully discover some of these other types of rhythms, including trochaic meter, spondaic meter, anapestic meter, and dactylic meter. And we're not going to get into the details of those, but I just wanted to let you know there were a lot more besides just the iambic meter. 
All right, so we've talk, talked about the iambic meter. Now we're going to get just a little more detailed and talk about iambic pentameter. Now, if we take a look at this word and break it down, we know that meter is, is, a, rhythm, is a rhythm that we find in poetry. You know that from your vocabulary words. And we know that this prefix here, penta, means what? That's right, five. And of course, we've just gone over what iambic means. So um, we know that iambic pentameter has something to do with a rhythm of five. So iambic pentameter is the meter in a verse or line of poetry that consists of five iams for a total of 10 syllables or beats per line. So I'll show you an example here. Now, we've seen the, this uh, bit of poetry before, but I wanted to show you something familiar. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's least hath all too short a date. Now, you've noticed here that I have put the accent symbols on the words. Now, if we count the number of I am's in this sentence, this line of poetry, we're going to see that there are five. One, two, three, four, five for a total of 10 syllables per line. And we're going to see in our next lecture that Shakespeare's sonnets are written in iambic pentameter so that each line consists of 10 syllables. So if you count these, you're going to find there's 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now, remember, a syllable is not a word. It is a part of a word. It's, it's a beat. A syllable's a beat. Same here. Let's look how many uh, iams we have. One, two, three, four, five. Again, we've got ten syllables. So we know that this quatrain from Sonnet 18, written by Shakespeare, is written in iambic pentameter. Iambic pentameter. Yeah, you can have whole poems that are written iambic pentameter, and you'll find that most of Shakespeare's sonnets are written in iambic pentameter. So you've got five iams per line for a total of ten syllables per line. This is just another little uh, summary of what we just talked about. So we've got iambic pentameter. We've broken it down. We know that uh, a meter is uh, the rhythm established in a line of poetry, usually determined by syllables and stresses. And we've talked about syllables. And we've talked about unstressed and stressed syllables. We've talked about iams. And we know that that's a foot, um, and it, it always has at least one unstressed syllable in it. We know that pent means five. So we know that iambic pentameter is a line of poetry that alternates unstressed syllables with stressed syllables, equaling 10 syllables per line of alternating stresses. So like this, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, just like we saw in the examples I just showed you. And once again, it sounds like a heartbeat. All right, so I'm gonna show you guys uh, another little video here, and hopefully this will help you to remember um, some things about iambic pentameter. So you don't need to worry about taking specific notes during this part, but think about how this vid video can help you remember what iambic pentameter is. To someone first encountering the works of William Shakespeare, the language may seem strange. But there is a secret to appreciating it. Although he was famous for his plays, Shakespeare was first and foremost a poet. 
One of the most important things in Shakespeare's language is his use of stress. Not that kind of stress, but the way we emphasise certain syllables in words more than others. We're so used to doing this that we may not notice it at first, but if you say the words slowly, you can easily identify them. Playwright. Computer. Telephone. Poets are very aware of these stresses, having long experimented with the number and order of stressed and unstressed syllables and combined them in different ways to create rhythm in their poems. Like songwriters, poets often express their ideas through a recognisable repetition of these rhythms or poetic metre. And like music, poetry has its own set of terms for describing this. In a line of verse, a foot is a certain number of stressed and unstressed syllables forming a distinct unit, just as a musical measure consists of a certain number of beats. One line of verse is usually made up of several feet. For example, a dactyl is a metrical foot of three syllables, with the first stressed and the second and third unstressed. Dactyls can create lines that move swiftly and gather force, as in Robert Browning's poem The Lost Leader. Just for a handful of silver he left us, just for a ribbon to stick in his coat. Another kind of foot is the two-syllable long trochee, a stressed syllable followed by an unstressed one. The trochees in these lines from Shakespeare's Macbeth lend an ominous and spooky tone to the witch's chant. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire, burn and cauldron, bubble. But with Shakespeare, it's all about the I am. This two-syllable foot is like a reverse trochee, so the first syllable is unstressed and the second is stressed, as in to be or not to be. Shakespeare's favourite metre in particular was iambic pentameter, where each line of verse is made up of five two-syllable iams for a total of ten syllables. And it's used for many of Shakespeare's most famous lines. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon. Notice how the iams cut across both punctuation and word separation. Meter is all about sound, not spelling. Iambic pentameter may sound technical, but there's an easy way to remember what it means. The word iam is pronounced just like the phrase I am. Now let's expand that to a sentence that just happens to be in iambic pentameter. I am a pirate with a wooden leg. The pirate can only walk in iams, a living reminder of Shakespeare's favourite metre. Iambic pentameter is when he takes ten steps. Our pirate friend can even help us remember how to properly mark it if we imagine the footprints he leaves walking along a deserted island beach. A curve for unstressed syllables, and a short line for stressed ones. If music be the food of love, play on. Of course, most lines of Shakespeare's plays are written in regular prose. But if you read carefully, you'll notice that Shakespeare's characters turn to poetry, and iambic pentameter in particular, for many of the same reasons that we look to poetry in our own lives. Feeling passionate. Introspective. Or momentous. Whether it's Hamlet pondering his existence, or Romeo professing his love, the characters switch to iambic pentameter when speaking about their emotions and their place in the world. Which leaves just one last question. Why did Shakespeare choose iambic pentameter for these moments rather than, say, trochaic hexameter or dactylic tetrameter? It's been said that iambic pentameter was easy for his actors to memorise and for the audience to understand, because it's naturally suited to the English language. But there might be another reason. The next time you're in a heightened emotional situation like the ones that make Shakespeare's characters burst into verse, put your hand over the left side of your chest. What do you feel? That's your heart, beating in irons. Da-dum, 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 da-dum. Shakespeare's most poetic lines don't just talk about matters of the heart, they follow its rhythm. <laughs> All right, you guys, so that is a nice overview of um, the iambic meter 
and iambic pentameter. And uh, next time we'll be um, learning more about Shakespeare's sonnets. So uh, stay tuned and be sure to submit the assignment related to this video.